Hello and welcome everyone to this collaboration between Amnesty International Denmark and World Pride in Copenhagen 2021. We all welcome you to this breakout session on the perception of LGBTI rights as a Western construct. My name is Maria Manir, my pronouns are they, them, and I'm an activist, uh, public speaker, non-binary human rights defender, and the trans lead for the Amnesty UK Rainbow Network. Now, in a short minute, I will be introducing all the panelists to you who are phenomenal human rights defenders from across the world, Brenda, Juanita, and Mehlab. Uh, but before we begin, I just want to give you a little bit of context on why we're talking about this topic today. So I think it's safe to say, or unsafe to say, that unfortunately, attacks on LGBTI plus people around the world are increasing almost globally at an astronomical level. We see day in, day out, so many accusations thrown, so many horrible narratives built about us, without us, in order to cast us in a negative light, to present us as a threat to society as a whole. And we have to remember the context for this. So we're talking about LGBTI rights being presented as a Western construct, but if anything, this is the culmination of a narrative that the West has itself contributed to through the demonization and colonization of countries worldwide. And so today we're going to be delving into how we reclaim our own narrative and how we make sure that the, this conversation centers and upholds the rights and perspectives of all LGBTI plus people across the world. And how we will combat this woven narrative is by having discussions like this where we get to the heart of why this issue matters and why it is so important that we counter this idea that somehow we are a threat to heteronormative structures to to cultures and value systems because if anything i know from working in this sector is that we are people filled and driven by our values determined to make this world a better place so now it is my privilege to introduce you to three people who are doing just that. So first, I would like to ask Brenda to please introduce yourself and explain a little bit about what you do and why you're here today. Hi, um, my name is Brenda Rodriguez Alegre. I am a trans pinay or a transgender woman. I'm from the Philippines, um, but I'm, uh, I'm currently I'm based in Hong Kong. Uh, I am a lecturer at the University of Hong Kong where I teach gender studies. Um, but in uh, outside of work, I'm also a human rights defender, um, an, an advocate for equality and inclusion, um, very specifically for LGBTQI um, and women. Um, and I think I'm here because of that. Uh, I'm here because uh, I, I do believe that our identities matter and I want um, um, our identities to be recognized. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brenda. Really looking forward to talking to you today. Um, and over to you, Juanita, please introduce yourself. Um, I'm Senfuka Janita Wari, and um, I work with uh, Freedom and Rome Uganda. We just celebrated 18 years yesterday, and it's an organization that works exclusively for LBQ women, LBQ women. And um, the reason as to why I'm here, it's because um, I would like to share part of um, our identities because assumption is that there are no LBQ or LGBT persons within Africa. So I am here to give an insight and share um, whatever we do here in Uganda. Thank you. Thank you so much, Juanita, and congratulations on the 10 year anniversary. That's amazing to hear. 18. Oh, 18. 18. Sorry, I didn't hear right. <laughs> Um, thank you. Thank you. And over to you, Mehlab, to introduce yourself. Hi, thank you so much. My name is Mehlab, and I am talking to you today from the beautiful city of Lahore in Pakistan. Um, I am a researcher, and I take a keen interest in issues of gender uh, and sexuality in post-colonial context, and um, I am also involved in uh, different advocacy measures for transgender rights in my country, that is Pakistan. And I was also involved in drafting a piece of legislation for transgender rights in Pakistan, which uh, gives the right of self-perceived identity to trans people. 
And um, other than that, I, um, uh, I do engage with different kinds of work related to feminist activism and leftist activism. And I am here today um, simply to speak my truth. Powerful words to end on. I think speaking our truth is something that, you know, we don't often get the chance to do when the narrative is being swept out from under our feet. And it's so important that we have these spaces where our voices are centered. So I think it would be great to start off by just learning a little bit more about the situations in your local context for those watching who may not know much about the local context that you have. So I'd like to know, you know, how are LGBTI plus people received and how are the words LGBTI perceived in your local context? Brenda. Um, in the, I'll, I'll focus uh, on the Philippines. Um, I hope you don't mind. Um, so in the Philippines, it's very it can be quite complicated, you know, because we do not have um, rights. We don't have um, it on paper. We don't have a gender recognition um, law. We do not have actually we don't have an anti discrimination ordinance. It's being debated up until now. Um, we call it SOGI or SOGI Equality Bill, but it's not um, passing through because there's great hindrance from the the legislatures and uh, the Catholic Church, unfortunately. Um, and we don't have equality union as well. Um, when we we don't have divorce uh, laws as well in the Philippines, and uh, our reproductive health uh, law was uh, greatly hindered for a long time before it got approved. So just looking at that from afar, you would see that um, um, in terms of protection and recognition of LGBTQI identities, it's very it's quite uh, prob it's very problematic. However, it as I mentioned earlier, it's quite complicated because culturally we are highly tolerated you know we are very visible maybe in the whole of Asia the Philippines tend to be quite um, a strong collective we, uh, you could trace back um, our efforts in Pride March for more than 20 years ago um, there are many LGBTQI organizations in the Philippines we are very visible in regional and global spaces but in spite of that I, um, uh, much as we are highly visible we're having a hard time um, pushing for our um, legislations to protect us I think because of the the, the greater force particularly religion so I think that one that that one context is such a hurdle for us uh, we have been colonized by Spain for almost 400 years years and further by America by almost 50 years and so we've had more than 400 years of colonized experience but before um, uh, we were um, colonized by Spain and America um, our culture has actually celebrated queerness transness and otherness so hopefully this space allows me to talk about them as well absolutely um, Juanita what, what do you have to say about your local context uh, so first and foremost, LGBT um, persons or homosexuality is uh, illegal in Uganda. First, uh, it's illegal within the penal code that is um, uh, Article 145 that criminalizes unnatural offenses against order of nature, which was which is not um, clearly defined. But um, fortunately. Unfortunately, uh, fortunately, we had an anti-gay bill that was nullified, well and good. But uh, this year, at the, in the at beginning of this year, there was um, a bill that was passed by parliament before the, the new parliamentarians came in. Uh, so it's called the Sexual Offenses Bill. In the Sexual Offenses Bill, there's a, there's a section that criminalizes homosexuality properly defined, having innocent is, is, um, is criminalized, having uh, the unnatural offense within the, the penal code is well defined in the, in the sexual offenses bill, which is uh, waiting for the president to assent to. And if the president assents to it, then we are illegal, not just by, uh, by practice, because the penal code talks about the unnatural offense, the act. But uh, the sexual offenses bill talks about the existence of who, of us. So if the president assents to that bill, then I don't know what will happen to uh, to Uganda. But much as we 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 as Ugandan discriminate and hate homosexuals, homosexuality existed way back before 
uh, before the colonials came to, to our countries. You know, it very well that when the colonials came to our country, that's when the anti gay laws started, you know, were put in place. But before, there were no laws criminalizing uh, homosexuality because it, it, it's a practice that was happening by the king of Buganda, by, by different people. But then it was not criminalized until the religion, Christianity, where uh, colonialists came in and, uh, and uh, criminalized homosexuality. So that is the, the current situation within here. But also even our culture. In the, before colonialists, uh, the kings used to have, uh, we had a king who was homosexual. But no one wants to talk about the fact that he was homosexual and he was drugged to have sex with a woman, to sleep with a woman, to have a child, but he used to date a fellow man. And um, when religion came in, that's when we, were, we, uh, we started being discriminated. And that's what is happening. That's what we live with. And the fact that we can't have audiences to speak about, to tell our truth, you know, we can't be on radio to tell our truth because there's fear for um, us uh, breaking marriages and uh, the fact that Uganda is a godly country uh, and so we cannot we cannot exist. So that's the kind of situation that we live in now, in Uganda now. Thank you, Juanita. I think what speaks to me so far through both what you and Brenda have said is that we have been erased from history, even though our history is still alive, and our very existence is being debated before our eyes, even though we are all here today and we have always been here. Um, yeah. Mehla, what do you have to say? I would say that when I always get very conflicted whenever this question is asked from me, because um, unfortunately, this question has come with a lot of violence itself in my context. So whatever I say about Pakistan, uh, it almost always ends up uh, feeding into a narrative of the oppressive, uh, homophobic, transphobic other uh, versus the progressive something else. Usually it's the West, right? So I'm very hesitant to pass myself as a person who's here to speak on behalf of an oppressed community or uh, against an oppressive state, knowing very well that I live the, the reality of that violence every day that comes not just from the state, but from the society itself, but also sometimes from those global narratives that cast me as this oppressed being that needs to be rescued. So um, having uh, put forth that disclaimer, I would say that um, Pakistan is one of those countries which has a very complex, very rich and very diverse history when it comes to gender and sexuality and um, we have uh, had a similar uh, history of a colonized past in which um, uh, uh, a law as an institution and the legal system itself was used as a tool of erasure for the native communities. Uh, native communities that defied those very strict labels what we now call gender and sexuality and that was, in fact, uh, the reason that it, the law itself became a very punitive institution. So uh, what we have here is uh, Section 377 in our penal code, which uh, criminalizes uh, sexual carnal intercourse, actually, against the order of nature. And in fact, it is one of the uh, uh, first few laws uh, that, came, uh, that came during the colonial time during, in the British colonies and were used as an experimentation uh, in codifying law. And again, this was exported to other countries. Uh, I believe Uganda is one of them, um, which this law is vague in its language, but uh, it is understood to criminalize same-sex conduct between uh, persons of male bodies. Uh, there is no law that specifically prohibits homosexuality or even defines homosexuality. Uh, there's often this misperception out there. And uh, convictions are also very rare under this law. Uh, however, it contributes to a broader environment of persecution, violence, and discrimination against people who are gender variant, who are different, who are, um, who are actually made to feel different in the society, and then uh, 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 are subjected to most horrific forms of violence based on that difference. 
So uh, that's uh, as far as the legal context and the social context goes. But despite that, um, what I'm particularly interested in and inspired by are uh, those narratives of resistance, those narratives of survival and thriving that, uh, that are actually uh, sometimes become visible, but most for the most part remain invisible and perhaps for good reason uh, that uh, somehow defy these binaries of best versus the other and oppressed versus the oppressor. And um, in this war of narratives, they still manage to carve out lives that are fully self-actualized and happy and peaceful. So um, that's what I would say about where I'm coming from. Thank you. That's definitely given us all, I think, a lot to talk about because it's so interesting to think about the context I live in as well as, you know, someone who's Pakistani living in the UK, a country that has long presented itself as the kind of home of human rights. If anything, it's the home of human rights violations. And it's so interesting as well that it presents this image of, oh, we're one of the safest place for LGBTI people to come in the world and it's just categorically not true it's you know a country where it says oh we have same-sex marriage legalized but then if you're a trans person who's married to someone else and you want to transition your spouse your partner is allowed to veto it and say no when how is that progressive right or a country where we still don't have you know uh, legal gender recognition for non-binary people or we have you know no access to good timely health care for LGBTI plus people particularly trans people and this is a country that still you know the narrative of this culture war that is being promoted right now is being imported still now across the world we can see the ramifications in countries that have long called themselves progressive but are actually mimicking these using them as an excuse to kind of put out that internalized, that very deep rooted, you know, LGBTI plus phobia that has existed for a long time. But what I was really keen to hear in all of your kind of stories just then is that narrative of resistance, right? We're all here because we're resisting. We're resisting what has been kind of told to us and delivered as a given. So what I'd like to hear from you is, what what kind of work is happening in your context right now? What are you part of that you feel proud of that you feel is kind of making history again? Um, Brenda? Um, I think for our organization, I, was a, I wasn't able to mention earlier that I'm actually part of STRAP, the Society of Trans Nice of the Philippines. Um, and the thing is, that is uh, the oldest existing trans organization in the Philippines. So we've been around for almost 20 years. Uh, we started as a support group because 20 years ago, there was really no such organization. So we had to work with um, all the other queer people, you know, under one umbrella, which is not a bad thing. But um, culturally, the very specific issues and concerns of trans people, specifically of trans women, uh, aren't really understood well. You know, like, for example, in terms of employment, in terms of uh, we don't have medical access because we don't have a health care as well. Um, um, and, and even the lexicon of transness is quite absent because the original lexicon of transness has been erased um, when we were colonized. So we used to have the shamans, you know, kind of similar to the hijras of South Asia, kind of, kind of similar to the two spirit people, you know, kind of similar to the mahu. So we used to have the babaylans or the asogs um, 400, 500 years ago, but they were made invisible. Some of them were obliterated, you know, from and erased totally, you know, from our histories. And we are now reclaiming um, our history. So that's one proud work that I could mention because of our organization, um, we are now trying to promote the, the, the importance of decolonization and intersectionality in the way that we think and in the work that we do. Um, that means that um, for, for us trans women, we wanted to be recognized as not being a Western uh, influenced identity that we originally we used to call ourselves transsexuals, we used to call ourselves transgenders, which are our uh, words that are Western, concepts that are also Western, but we want to remind our people, but we used to be your babaylans, we used to be your assholes. We have been around, and 400 years ago, we are equals, 
we are part of society and in fact we occupy the very important space we used to be your healers we used to we used to remind you of how important it is to uh, uh, protect nature but um, um, this is the time for us to unfortunately you know the, the dark <laughs> the history that we had in our past erased our people but now we have an opportunity to re-educate uh, our people so the pandemic has been very um, cruel to all of us around the world, but in the Philippines, we made the most out of being online by doing more online engagements. So we did a lot of virtual workshops and uh, education sessions where we keep emphasizing the importance of our uh, pre-colonial transness. We ask people to look into the importance of decolonization and the works of decolonization and intersectionality that uh, we have shared histories, we have shared um, identities, we have shared struggles and shared, hopefully shared victories. So um, we were successful last year somehow, if I can use the word successful, in making ourselves very her her audible and visible again. Um, we have revitalized our memberships and we are ensuring that we get to our grassroots because the Philippines is an archipelago. So there are places in our 7,100 islands that we could not reach. You know, people may assume that we speak in English as a second language because of our colonial past, but um, that, that doesn't mean that the rest of our people could. So they, could, they don't have access to technology and to education. So we're trying to get to them. And that's uh, one work that we're proud of right now, you know, giving voice to the voiceless. Yeah. That's really powerful to hear. And I think you make so many brilliant points, especially about language and how important and empowering it is to be able to not only know who you are, but say who you are um, and say who you are without fear. And I think, you know, a theme that is kind of coming through is that it's so important to kind of not only reclaim our history, but rewrite what's happening now. Um, Juanita, what, what is this kind of story that you want to tell? Um, about your organization, about how you're resisting um, the narrative? So uh, generally in Uganda, the LGBTI community in general is a resistant group. We are resistant. First of all, we, we refused to be erased, even though it continues, the effort continues, but we are still here. Um, we have uh, grown from one organization because Farug was the first, uh, the first organization in 2003. Right now, then second, uh, the year that followed, we had we, we formed a network, uh, which Farug is part of, that is Sexual Minorities Uganda, where I, I, I sit on the board as the treasurer. And from Sexual Minorities Uganda, we have so many organizations in almost every part of the country in its homophobic state, both in rural and urban setting. We have resisted by uh, taking the government. First of all, uh, we've had a case which was called, which was Victor Mkasa and Oyo versus uh, the state, which we won. We have had different cases where we've taken uh, part of sexual minorities Uganda. We took, um, we took, we, took the Uganda Bureau of Registration to court for failure to reserve the name sexual minorities, that is resistance. We have gone ahead um, to engage the Ministry of Health in Uganda. And somewhere, somehow, somewhere, there is uh, acceptance of same-sex, of MSMs and transgender in the fight against HIV. We as LBQ women are fighting to be included we, be, we are always pushed here and there, but we resist. We are part of it, and we need uh, members, people like us who are living with HIV to be considered in the programming of the ministries. We have resisted by organizing pride in this country that has, where uh, being homosexual, homosexual is um, hard, but we've had, I think, three or four pride parades. That is resisting. We have gone ahead to have organizations that are set up uh, that do wonderful work for, the, for our communities. We have gone ahead to do research that will help stakeholders like the ministries and people who have uh, Ugandans who don't understand that homosexuals exist within their society. We have had different campaigns. We have had campaigns like Let Us Live in Peace that was done by Freedom Ayom to inform 
the the general Ugandans that this LGBT live within your your home. They could be your mother, your father, your relative, your uncle. We have gone ahead to release different research. We did a research as Freedom and Rome on lived realities among LBQ women. That is an, a countrywide uh, research on the stories, compiling stories, and the, what the realities that LBQ uh, women live with, live with in the society. We've documented that and given it to, to, to stakeholders to understand what we go through. We have just this year before the lockdown, we launched a book on queering SRHR, a guide to LBQ women. Because in the past, health workers had a notion that they have no information on LBQ health. And that guide is to assist the health workers to understand issues around issues of health that LBQ women uh, go through so that they can improve on service delivery that is still resisting. I can go on and on and on. We have actually started, we started a podcast that uh, it's called Bakuya Togele. It's que Let the Queer Speak. It talks about the, the, the erased group within the LGBT. Lesbians are not at the forefront. So we fight to get to that level. So this podcast speaks, uh, podcast is called Bakuya Togele. We air issues or stories of what lesbians have done within the society. And also the other part of storytelling, we have, it's called the uh, Lesbica Diaries, that gives stories of empowerment, stories that have, have, have been achieved by LBQ women. So in a nutshell, we have resisted even beyond that. We have resisted, but for, for the sake of this time, I'll just share a brief. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I think it speaks for itself that this is the product of, you know, communities coming together, organizing for years and years and years. It's the efforts and the hard work, the kind of challenges, and then trying to get the very heart of those institutions that have always tried to stop us and flipping them on their head and saying, no, that is not what we accept. This is how things should be done. And that is the power in us kind of taking control of our lives and our destiny. And in a way that I think is even more evident than before, especially like you mentioned with, uh, you know, social media and the rise of more accessible virtual um, kind of events and things like people are being inspired by one another from around the world so I'm sure many people listening today will take heart in what everyone has shared and maybe start initiatives like that themselves too um, the most important the most important that I had forgotten is um, the fact that we resisted by fighting back when Scott Lively came in Uganda introduced the anti-gay law with the, the, the with other religious leaders. We had to take him to court in his own country to ask him to, to remind, to ask him to revert the homophobia that was exported to Uganda. That led to death of some of our colleagues. So we took him to court in the US. So we resist even the religious, with the religious leaders who come in with a notion of monopolizing God now. God created all of us in his own image. And I continue to, we continue to remind people that homosexuality is African. Homophobia is what was imported. Thank you. Yeah, that is, that is something that I definitely am going to hold on to those words because I think there's so much power in us kind of taking the tools that have been used to stop us like legislation and being able to fight back in those areas and to kind of rewrite those rules that have been pushed on us and it's certainly one of the reasons why now I'm going on to qualify as a barrister because we need more people like us who can do that who can fight those challenges for all of us um, thank you Juanita um, Mela, what do you have to share in terms of the stories of resistance that you were speaking to before uh, I'm very inspired uh, to hear from Brenda and Juanita and from you, Maria, uh, uh, about the kind of narratives of resistance that manage to survive and manage to sustain communities. Um, so um, when I'm being asked to put, a, put forward a narrative of resistance, um, 
I, your, your question, what does resistance look like, um, is I'm going to take that as a starting point because um, the resistance that becomes visible uh, gives us a lot of clues about what exactly has been rendered invisible. So let me start from a moment of uh, erasure because we've been talking about erasure and visibility. So that moment of erasure is, uh, as is commonly understood, came for us in, in, during the 19th century in 1860s and 70s when a colonial law was imposed on native populations as a method of control, right? Uh, what I would like to say, uh, perhaps, is that, in fact, it was not an erasure of a pre-existing history. I think it was an act of rendering something visible for the law, right? So the way law defined communities, it sought to render certain bodies, certain experiences readable by the law so as to punish them, right? And by defining those bodies defining those acts, the law actually sought to give definition to itself and, and the, the metropole sought to give, seek to give definition to itself, right? Um, that moment itself has sort of become sealed in history as, as this dark moment uh, where, where victims, where um, victims of colonial violence have absolutely no voice. And if any voice comes out, it's through those very oppressive archives that See, tend to see them through those very same mediums of visibility that were used, in fact, to enact that violence, right? But what is perhaps interesting here is that when we move on from that failed moment of rendering something visible in order to make it more uh, easy to be attacked and persecuted is uh, our own national history. So let me, let me try to sort of come to a point of um, resistance by talking about the kind of a unique history that Pakistan has had and the kind of unique moment that Pakistan occupies uh, when it comes to struggles around gender and sexuality. So we have gone through successive regimes of military occupation, uh, mil uh, mil martial law, but when our own military has been, um, has uh, 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 held the constitutional, constitution and fundamental rights in abeyance, and enacted extreme forms of violence uh, on its own people, right? And in, in, in most of those cases, those dictators, that military institution were being supported by Western democracies. And uh, most recently in 1980s, when a military regime introduced so-called Sharia laws, it was being supported by Western democracies in order to further their strategic gains in the Afghan war. And that violence, that violence rendered on Afghan people, that violence rendered on Pakistani people is something that we still live with. And it's from those histories of violence, by understanding those histories of violence, can we somehow attempt to frame and understand the, the, our own narratives of resistance. So um, uh, as a result of an other dictatorship that lasted for almost a decade in, in the early 2000s, um, what happened was that a lawyer's movement sprung up, which became a people's movement against a military dictator, right? This was a people's movement asking for constitutional rights, asking for fundamental rights. This was a moment of rupture. It was a moment of protest. People were out in the streets asking for rights. Talking about rights became, became a thing, right? So, and it was, it was kind of in that moment when something very interesting happened, and I love to tell this story a lot because it is something very close to my heart, um, that in a city close to the capital in Pakistan, uh, there was uh, a, a police uh, raid happened at a private gathering. And as a result of that, the, the police tortured and arrested a couple of uh, uh, men and trans women. Now I'm using the word trans women here cautiously, the language use at the time was different. Um, as a result of that, some 200, 300 people gathered outside that police station and started protesting. They were protesting, they literally picked up those, the flower pots outside the police station and started throwing them like at the police, at the policemen. 
to the point that policemen actually became so afraid that they barricaded themselves in that police station and asked for reinforcements to be brought around. Now, there are many ways to read this incident, and there, are many, there have been many interpretations of uh, this incident, including calling it our own Stonewall riot, which is perhaps uh, rather a reductionist and, once again, a Western-centric way of understanding our, our own unique moment of protest that we were having. But what was interesting here was that, that that protest of trans people, of hijras, of pajasaras, became, uh, uh, got the attention of the judiciary. And that was a moment when the Supreme Court took notice. And Supreme Court took notice because the judge himself had led an entire movement against a military dictator. There was a, there was a common language of protest going on here. And there, this was coming from an entire history of public interest litigation for the oppressed communities in Pakistan. And what in 2009, it led to recognition of a third gender identity in Pakistan, right? And that started an entire litigation and, and policy process where um, uh, the judiciary was, uh, the higher courts were giving one judgment after other, which can perhaps be considered progressive in, in certain terms, leading to um, access of more rights for trans people, for gender variant people, right? And at that time, a specific language of understanding this, this transgender movement, uh, so it, as, as if it's come to be known, uh, came forth. The, the word that is used locally here is Kwaja Sara, which is a pre-colonial term, uh, and it's a very respectful term for people who uh, associate with, the, uh, with what is broadly known in South Asia as the Hijra community, right? So uh, as a result of that, there are lots of legal and policy developments happening. And what it leads to, what it culminates into is um, in 2018, when uh, the, the parliament of Pakistan uh, seeks to draft a law uh, for the protection of rights of transgender people in Pakistan. Um, I was fortunate enough to be part of that uh, legislation process. Um, but it was a long battle leading to a long and even longer struggle for rights. But what I remember and what I hold most um, dear to me is a moment when I was sitting across an entire panel of um, religious clerics and bureaucrats from the Council of Islamic Ideology. It's a, it's a statutory body in, in Pakistan that provides recommendation on any la laws that have to be passed. I was sitting across them, and to my right and to my left were sitting trans people who have had amazing struggles throughout their lives through which they have managed to survive and thrive and be happy and speak their truth in the most powerful manner. And I was, I was scared. I was, I was very nervous because I would be honest, like my legs were shaking a little bit because I was like, okay, if this goes wrongly, then, you know, we are screwed. Um, pardon my language. So, um, but looking to my right and left to these folks who were just, you know, holding their heads high up, I, I, got, I got that courage that I needed. I got that courage from my community that I needed. And I spoke and I talked about the erasure that we went through and the visibility that we still managed to have the rights that we had and the rights that were denied to us and the Islamic histories that are once again cast in this sort of very dark narrative of oppression. Oh, uh, LGBTI rights cannot be actualized because Islam is against them. I spoke in that very Islamic language, in that very Islamic idiom of rights to, to speak, for, speak my truth, to, put, to say to this entire panel of bureaucrats and religious clerics that I exist. I exist and my existence matters. It matters because I'm sitting in front of you right now asking for that right. And if you don't give that to me, I'm still going to keep fighting. And that was a very powerful moment. And um, eventually it became one of those things which was uh, perhaps instrumental in getting a law passed, which has allowed trans people to hold the right of self-determination of their identity, which is like one of, Pakistan is one of those very few countries in the world which actually has that kind of an enabling framework for trans people to self-identify. And 
uh, while there are so many problems and there are so many, there's so much bureaucratic red tape to work through, it has ha been a powerful moment because we were, we were the people who this law sought to oppress. And we were the people who were speaking back at the law through that legal language. We were saying that we exist and that law which sought to oppress us is the law that is going to give us our rights back. And that is really the history of transgender rights movement in Pakistan, in which transgender people have uh, made immense sacrifices to put themselves out there, to, to fight these powers that be, to carve their narratives of resistance from within the law, from within these structures, to ask for their rights. And there are so many um, interesting policy developments that are happening in Pakistan, whether it comes to health or it comes to education or a lot of other things in which trans people are being recognized and being uplifted. Of course, there are many problems within that as well, and I'm not denying that, but that is how, um, you know, the, the, the resistance that we are talking about is taking shape and it's giving voice to a lot of people. So I'll end there. Absolutely. I mean, I really felt like I was there with you every step of the way. And the reason why that's so powerful and important is because you are also telling part of my history and my story in, in sharing that. So I really thank you for that. And I think something that has become clear through all of your excellent contributions is this perception that LGBTI rights are a Western construct. I think we are undoing it today in the stories that we are sharing because these aren't rights that were given to us by Western or white European people. These are rights that we created for ourselves, rights that we fought for for ourselves, rights that we established and defined and named for ourselves, rights that we know that we have, but because of the institutions around us, we have to fight to get recognized. And I think that's kind of a key takeaway for me always is that sometimes we are sold or missold this idea that we don't have rights, but it's the institution that has decided to deny us those fundamental things that make us who we are. And it is our power and it is our campaigning and it is our fight to those institutions that helps us to keep our communities alive and as safe as we can um, in these incredibly trying times always. So as we come to an end of this brilliant discussion, I'm sure everyone who's watching will have many questions for the live Q&A. Uh, I, I just want to kind of take a moment to ask you all briefly, what is the one thing that you want people to take away from this discussion today? Um, if you can summarize it in a few sentences, that would be great. So uh, Brenda, starting with you. Well, first of all, thank you for giving us this um, space and this opportunity. Um, I think um, I've, been, I've been doing this work for more than 20 years now, and uh, it's taking a toll uh, more on my body um, and then to my soul, actually, and, and to my mind. But uh, one thing that I would like to um, uh, ask everyone to, to consider is, hopefully we will come to a point wherein we don't anymore beg for our human rights, you know, or we don't anymore have to beg for our rights just to be recognized, to be included, you know, to be treated as equals. You know, if, even when the world, the time comes that um, all countries in the world already have all of these rights that protect us, that recognize us, you know, that, that gives us equity and um, um, access to everything, even if that time comes, um, th it will be a long time that um, um, our people will actually find that kind of solace in themselves because the damage has been done, you know, for hundreds of years, maybe thousands of years in, in the case of some. And um, it's a day-to-day -day struggle for others. You know, those narratives also matter, you know. Even when the time comes that there is rights already to be recognized, to be protected, to, to, have to undergo union, some people will still look at themselves in the mirror and not not see their authentic versions of themselves. So the struggle will continue. So hopefully at this point, we don't want to feel that we have to continue begging for our rights. Absolutely. And I hope everyone who's listening and watching who has, you know, the ears of institutions, who has the power to, you know, help us in our fight can pull their weight to those allies who we need to, to listen to us and be led by us. 
Um, Juanita, um, what are a few things that you want to share um, with those who are listening today? Um, it's just a reminder uh, to everyone out there that uh, homosexuality is not Western. It has never been. Homophobia is Western. So we are here. We will continue to, to speak our truth. We are not going anywhere. We are in this country. We are born Ugandans or in Africa and other parts of, of the world. We will always be here. But we cannot hide who we are. Yeah. Thank you very much, Juanita. And Mela, what would you like to share with the audience today? I have a lot to say, but um, perhaps I'll end on, on this note that um, since it's, it's since we are talking about pride and we are talking about um, what it means to put oneself out there to be visible, I would just say that um, people, I would, people should understand other human beings and connect with other human beings through that shared connection of humanity rather than through idioms of uh, visibility and pride because there, there are a lot of people who get erased in that narrative of pride and who end up being on the receiving end of violence because of that pride. Because when you say pride, you create the opposite of shame and you render everybody who's in shame invisible when in fact their voices matter. In fact, it is their voices that matter the most. So when, when you see a very glorified um, history or very glorified narrative of what it means to be, to be full of pride and what it means to be visible, just remember the people who are invisible, who are unseen, but who are still living their lives. And you can be an ally to them. You can have empathy for them. And that empathy comes from that solidarity, that, that decolonized solidarity, I would say, which does not render human beings into um, categories in order to make them understandable. It just prizes that human connection above all. And that's how you can be an ally and we need allies. That's what I would end on. Thank you so much. And I think that is a brilliant note to end on. Um, you know, we as LGBTI plus people, we have, we, there is no reason why we should bend over backwards to make ourselves kind of likable or lovable to anyone other than those whom we want to be loved by right there's no reason why we should have to change who we are because who we are is not fitting with the categories that are being assigned to us or the rules that are being made around us there's no reason why we above anyone else should have to change what does need to change is those antiquated narratives, those people who think that they can use their powers, abuse their powers against us and think that we won't fight back. And as much as I hate this narrative of a fight back, unfortunately we are fighting every day. And that's why it is so important that we take stock of what, what are those um, things in our arsenal? What are the things we can draw on? across our global communities? How can we support one another across our context so that we can unite and you know, change the way that we are being perceived, but also the ways that we perceive one another? Make sure that nobody is left behind in this fight because at the end of the day, when one person becomes accepted, another person becomes another, right? So it is so important that we continue to strive towards this future together. So thank you so much to every single one of you, our esteemed panelists who have taken the time to be so generous with your wisdom, your stories and your passion. And I really hope that those who are listening today can understand that this is what it means to counter those narratives. Thank you. <laughs>